So I, without more ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Councillor Rose Moore is the cabinet member for a greener and safer Chelmsford. Um, and she's also on the waterways working group of the council. And um, so she's uh, right at the heart of the decision making, which uh, will shape the future of our waterway. So I'm delighted she's agreed to talk to us this evening. So uh, without more ado, Rose, over to you. Thank you very much, William, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us online. Uh, it's not my first online Zoom experience, but it is the first time that I've presented using PowerPoint with my very able assistant, William, this evening, um, who will be in charge of slides. So I hope we'll go smoothly. Um, as William mentioned, we will have opportunity for questions to, after each section, really. We thought we'd best to break it down because there's quite a lot to cover. Um, and of course, any ideas, any thoughts and ideas, it would be lovely perhaps to stay online afterwards and you can let me know contact details if, if I've missed things tonight. Um, because really the purpose of this is to engage with you this evening and with lots of stakeholders and interested people and community groups across Chelmsford and the wider district. So thank you once again for taking the time and I hope you'll enjoy understanding a little more about our vision for Chelmsford's waterways. So if you'd like to start with the first slide. Fingers crossed. Do you have a slide view? Excellent, excellent. I think we're there. So I am cabinet member for a safer and greener Chelmsford. Um, but I was just elected newly to the council last May and I stood for election really because I wanted to uh, have a well, be a voice for people who were underrepresented in terms of the amount of development that was going on locally and what I saw was the undermining of our very delicate ecology locally. It just seemed to be all about building and development with very little um, thought given to the ecological infrastructure that's so vital. And right in the heart of that, running through our city, is just one of our rivers, um, which again, we've seen over the years, the city seemed to turn its back on, on these amazing waterways as um, new buildings went up, notably um, the Odeon complex, for example. So uh, I was very honored to be elected. And after one year, we've seen lots of change in the administration really through the services that we're delivering as a major employer and through our regulatory and strategic functions, local authorities can and should be at the forefront of local renewal as we all learn to live differently, certainly in the light of the challenge we face, which is the climate and ecological crisis. We should lead by example. So in the next slide, it will outline to you Chelmsford Policy Board it was set up on the 16th of June, 2019, and we held our first meeting. The intention was to have a series of working groups established that would deal with different elements affecting the people of Chelmsford and the local environment. Amongst them, a rough sleeping and homelessness working group, a movement around the city uh, working group, and local democracy and community engagement working groups. No less important was the waterways working group, because it's at the heart of the city, and it reaches into the corners of our district. Cross-party working groups, it was very important that we had those and we wanted to establish a dialogue between all, all politicians within the council. So the um, working group itself comprises three um, Lib Dems, one independent and one uh, conservative councillor. The working groups would be established to examine existing policies and develop new ones in line with the new administration's aims. A greener, fairer, safer and better connected Chelmsford. We determined that policies and strategies must benefit Chelmsford as a whole and be owned by the community. And the climate and ecological emergency that we declared in July 2019 implied immediate priority actions across all directorates and would inform all policies going forward. And the accompanying all important action plan 
was approved by Cabinet in January of this year. So the next slide shows you a little about the membership of the working group. Oh, I do apologize, that's actually a brainstorming image from the working group. This is our first meeting in June of 2019, when members were all um, asked to just go to a whiteboard and write down things that mattered to them, um, any elements of the waterways that they currently enjoy, challenges we faced. We wanted to uh, establish priorities from this session for the year 19, sorry, 2019 to 20. That was first and foremost to improve navigation. And we had to determine the future of the automatic floodgates on the River Chalmer, and we'll have more on that later. And we wanted to host a workshop uh, for the purposes of engaging local people, river users, interested um, residents, community groups, anyone with a really an interest in being part of the process in shaping the future of the waterways. Now, the next slide does tell you a little about the membership. As I mentioned, it's cross party. So we have five members, all councillors and um, currently serving uh, Neil Gulliver, Richard Lee and myself and Ian Fuller are all also involved with Springfield Parish Council and uh, are either city councillors for Springfield or Chalmers Village and Beaulieu Park. So we have a very keen interest in Sanford Mill and its future. And um, uh, Keith Bentley, an independent councillor, is passionate about the waterway and the crouch area around um, Southwood and Ferris. So we have a, a very passionate voices within this working group. The officers at the helm, we have Keith Nicholson, who's the director lead, and he is the director of public places. Um, Paul Van Dam works with him as a manager of our parks and green spaces, and Paul was tasked with the job of overseeing the Waterways Working Group. Stuart Graham is their Economic Development and Implementation Services Manager. Jeremy Potter is the manager of spatial planning. In other words, everything appertaining to our local plan and the direction that the city takes in its development over the course of the next decade. And Joe Reedy is corporate property services manager. So he deals with estates and property held by the council and, and other elements of the corporate division. We moved on to our waterways workshop, which is the next slide. And it just outlines for you, uh, the date was the 14th of February, which seems a lifetime ago, given what happened in the, the month that followed. Um, we had 42 attendees who were invited from across Chelmsford, um, a special guest too of Darren Tansley, who I think you may know from Essex Wildlife Trust, who is a very passionate advocate for our local ecology. We also had students from Rittle University College attend because they had some quite incredible and beautiful proposals for um, reimagining Sanford Mill and the water meadows and other stakeholders really the Sea Cadets, Chumster Canoe Club and I was introduced to J.A. Baker's writing in his beautiful book The Peregrine on that day and I have a copy on my desk now it's a it's, I often go to it if I need some solace. So we reached the stage where at the end of that outline of of the working group and the first waterways workshop if there are any questions anyone would like to ask or if indeed you attended the workshop and would like to say anything about that i'd be very happy to take questions the stunned silence i think one question that we had was um when was the uh, do we know when the the next installment of that workshop is likely to be in fact, only this afternoon, Richard Lee, who's our chair, emailed the, the councillors within the working group to say, please, can we arrange a meeting next week, an internal meeting, because we need to move things forward again. The, um, I'm afraid there was a rather a hiatus um, caused by uh, the pandemic. It's the only time I mention it this evening, but it meant that our Paul Van Dam, who manages Parks and Green Spaces, was very busy um, involved also, as he is with the cemetery and crematorium and bereavement services and other officers were obviously busy building contingency into our budget so i'm afraid it was unavoidably detained um, but we would like very much to have another um, session it may well be easier just to do that online um, by the end of the year 
um, not least to reinforce what I'm going to share with you this evening and, and hopefully we'll know more then about our budget for the automatic wear replacement. Rose, can I ask a question, please? It's Neil from the Charmel Canal Trust. Hello, Neil. Hi. Um, are there any terms of reference for your working group published? So, you know, it's, it's fabulous yes. to know that working groups have been set up. Yes. And, and where can we find them? All of the terms of reference are um, available. I, whether they're all up on the website, but they should be, um, if you go to the City Council website, oh, forgive me, because I'm trying to think through the, the labyrinth to get there, but with committees and meetings page, there should be um, a search function for working groups. And within that, you'll find all the different terms of reference outlined. If you can't immediately find that, I know we have agreed them at policy boards. So they'll be minuted in one of Trump's policy boards meetings from last year. So there'll be the latter part of last year, Trump's policy board. Um, and I think- yeah, it's Sounds like a challenge, but thank you. It's, it's a labyrinth, <laughs> but once you're, once you're in, <laughs> you'll never leave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll never get out, thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, Rose. It's uh, Mark and Leonora Walner. Uh, we live at Barnes Mill, which is the mill um, on the way down to Sanford Mill from Chelmsford. Yes. Uh, we have 20 years of experience of living in a, a mill, um, enduring every kind of weather imaginable, um, watching water levels go up nine feet at times. And uh, we would love to participate and provide the benefit of our experience and views in future discussions uh, when you think there's an appropriate forum for us to join in. Certainly, absolutely. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to share contact details with me afterwards and I'll make sure that you're on our list. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Is Essex Waterways represented? The I'm, Inland Waterways Association is. Essex Waterways, I will check. They may well have been in attendance at the workshop and I missed them because I was in a in the ecological group and perhaps I perhaps they were elsewhere in the room. There were three groups in discussion on that day. But I will check. Roy Chandler is, is in this meeting tonight. He's the chair of the board of Essex Waterways. Oh well then Roy was definitely there, I think, in his capacity as um, with Crackle as well. So they would have had representation. I apologise that I didn't know that that was perhaps who he was representing on the day. I've just made a note to double check that they're on the list. Okay, are there any further questions or shall we uh, move on to the next section? Let's move on. Hey, sorry, William. Uh, I was trying to connect, but uh, not making it. Are you hearing me? I'm yes, hearing yeah, we Roy. can. Yeah. yeah, it's Roy. Sorry, Roy Chandler, Hello. Uh, Director of Essex Waterways. Yes, we were at the meeting, and in fact, uh, we did do a presentation to the workshop as well, uh, along with Darren. So uh, we wow. were there. We did. We did participate. Thank you. I will definitely add you to the slideshow then as a participant and make sure you'll be, you'll certainly be on the official list of Paul Van Damme's office. Thank yes. you for confirming. Yes, we are. Yeah. So let's move on to the Chelmer automatic weir replacement, which was one of our priorities to determine. You'll probably know the history of this, um, this matter. Um, for years, there's been discussion about a cut in, um, in Chelmsford um, and an improvement in uh, the use of the navigation in the center. Um, we understood that um, the Environment Agency um, they informed us that they would no longer be funding maintenance of the gates um, uh, as their purpose was to keep water within the Springfield Basin and not so it wasn't officially flood prevention so they were able to legally withdraw from the maintenance as we understood it and um, it wasn't an immediate withdrawal but we were likely to lose funding within five years so we needed to assess uh, the um, possibility of a new Chalmer automatic weir replacement 
um, we commissioned Jacobs to draw up a feasibility study. And that was presented to the Waterways Group in January uh, of 2020. The broad consensus was reached then that the replacement of the automatic floodgates on the Chalmer and a provision of the lock to enable navigation between the upper and lower Chalmer should be the proposed way forward to keep the automatic gates in action and to enable navigation upstream. This was preferred to further consideration of a full link or cut between the Chalmer and the canal. If we have a look at um, slide eight, it will moving on. Um, oh, sorry, that the previous slide did show you um, where the river champ, where the um, automatic weir structure currently is. Is that the one or no? There's a there's a photo. Can we go back one, William? Oh, no. They're in a slightly different order to what we rehearsed, I think. Could try going back one more. Oh. Oh, well, not to worry. We'll, you, you'll know, I'm sure you'll all know that the junction we mean. Um, but uh, if we move on now, uh, actually, no, we're at the right place. Sorry, <laughs> the existing, the existing automatic gates. There we are. So they are currently maintained by the Environment Agency, but the agency has now served notice on the council that they will relinquish the responsibility in the near future. As it stands, this structure provides two core flunk functions. Uh, we understand it's the retention of water within the channels of the rivers Can and Chalmer in the city centre and control and release of flood water into the floodplain southeast of the structure. An objective of the City Council is to maximise the use of our waterways, and this is a core objective of our corporate plan, which we've renamed Our Chelmsford Our Plan and is available to view via the website. So in January 2020, the findings of an optioneering study were conducted at the request of Chumpsford City Council. The purpose of this was to investigate potential options and the associated cost for replacement of the existing automatic gates and weir structure. So if we move on to the next slide, it will show you the preferred option, which is to replace the existing automatic weir gates with new automatic weir gates, with a new gate design, um, either all radial or all tilting, with the inclusion of lock gates on one side of the riverbank. The report stated that the design life for the automatic weir has not been agreed, and for the purpose of the study, they'd reviewed an initial design life of 50 years. The selected option meets the two key objectives that we specified, the retention of water within the existing channels, and enabling navigation upstream of the structure. We move the slide, the next slide. Also shows here a proposed feeder channel which runs adjacent to and parallel with the new road bridge structure. As part of the feasibility study, we wanted to look into options for renewable energy. And so the next slide shows you a couple of options that were, were scoped really. They're probably the more successful of, I think we looked at solar PV as well, but unfortunately it's just not the capacity in the space for that to achieve any level of uh, energy generation um, riverside. The first that you see at the top here is a, an ancient form actually, the Archimedes screw, um, which is a, a, a essentially a, a turbine um, and that would be positioned at the three large sluice gates. Uh, the Archimedes screw can be installed in place of one of the sluice, sluice gates, provided that the reduction in flow capacity is acceptable to the council or in the space available on the south bank side. Basically, river water flows downstream through the Archimedes screw. And the generator kickstarts the initial rotation of the screw pump. The water flow rotates the screw, converting mechanical energy into electrical energy. Operation of the screw is possible by remote control, and if required, the intake can be shut off by means of automatic stop logs. A coarse screen at the intake will ensure no large debris falls into the screw. And the Archimedes screws come in varying sizes and capacity and can be tailored to customer specification. 
It's envisaged that the flow of water through a turbine like this would not be dissimilar to the flows that currently occur through the existing sluices. The intake velocity should not be any greater than the existing velocity, so it shouldn't present a major disruption to passing vessels. It's recommended that during the next phase of work on feasibility, this option should be further investigated to ensure the benefits from installing such a system can justify the funding that we'd need. The second option you see below uh, this is the hydropower or turbulent hydro. It's a special kind of vortex turbine that generates low cost electricity without the ecological impact, large civil works and high upfront investment costs. At Chelmsford, it's possible to implement this technology as there is adequate free land available on the south side of the weir structure. Some of the key benefits with turbulent hydro such as this are that it's fish friendly um, with a design that creates low shear stress and the slow rate of pressure difference over the blade ensures that this turbine allows fish and aquatic life to pass by unharmed. Also, low maintenance with superb quality components a trash rack is included for protection from larger debris and only one moving component allows the turbine to produce energy with hardly any maintenance cost. It is a long operating life too, provided the maintenance plan is followed, they are estimated to have a lifetime of 30 years. These turbines work with nature, they do not obstruct normal water flow, so they eliminate flood risk. And they are easy to install, although uh, I'm not sure I've managed one but the Vortex Turbine is the smallest in its kind for each given energy level and it come pre-assembled and are transported to site. As with the hydropower, the Archimedes screw option, it was recommended that the option should be further investigated during the next phase of work for feasibility and cost benefit. And I'm a little trepidant to ask because I'm not a civil engineer, but if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to make a note of them and tell and take them to our um, specialist team at the council. I see you're all oh. dumbfounded. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the only reason I'm kicking in again here, we actually had a full feasibility study carried out at the mill about 10 years ago. And um, they, the analysis was that we generate enough electricity to power up to 16 homes oh my goodness. Go back to the grid so I'm very pleased to share that full study with you if, if you'd like in case there was anything in there that might be relevant absolutely Mark thank you gosh that's fascinating yeah yeah no we'd love to be uh, we'd love to be uh, fully uh, self-sufficient <laughs> and uh, it's uh, we, the trouble is that there's a uh, quite a large upfront cost um, exactly. but it, it would pay itself back fairly quickly and no adverse environmental impact. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll send it over, see what you think. Thank you very much. Hello there. Hello. Um, I've got a question about um, what goes alongside of the, uh, the, the new weir structure. You talk about a lock there. I'm wondering about uh, fish passes going upstream. I don't yeah. know whether that, that's part of the consideration. It, absolutely, yes. Um, thank you for raising that. Um, we know we need different facilities for different species. Um, roach will move differently to eel. Um, and we sought advice from Darren Tansley on this, in, um, actually within the workshop, but subsequently to that, I've been reading up um, with his advice. Um, it's a crucial part of the design stage. Um, we have to integrate a, a bypass channel of some sort and we would need to also integrate brushes for eels because um, the young eels apparently use the brushes for climbing upstream mm -hmm. rather than swimming. So um, it has been considered and it would go on, obviously, be part of the considerations going forward. Yeah, as a think. canoeist rather than a fisherman, I've got a, a sideways thought on this in that along the River Medway, there are, the fish passes are also used for allowing canoes to travel downstream. Now, Excellent. I wonder if that was going to be part of the scheme as well. That I will check with you, sir, just to be sure that we, we yeah, have addressed that. They, they use the same brush shoots um, for canoes to go down as the fish can go up and down. Ah, Excellent. Well, that sounds like we are looking at the same 
technology well, there. So. Okay, and uh, that just sort of saves a lot of work getting going around the structure as Absolutely. a canoeist, because we Absolutely. obviously won't be using the locks. <laughs> no. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Can I take your name, sir? Sorry, you were you're, you're there as Pam, but I'm yeah, expecting that yeah, you're not. Pam, Pam sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Mike, sorry. Mike, Thank Mike. you, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. May I ask a, a quick question, please? Uh, with, with the new lock gates, obviously uh, maintaining water flow, flow through in times of high water is essential because um, I don't know if we're the only place along the river, but we're literally within centimetres at high water levels of uh, catastrophe. So it is vital that that is really considered and nothing lower than what is in place. But um, there was talk a little while ago of a flood alleviation scheme before the new um, uh, bridge went across the river. Yes. Is, is that still on the table? I know a farmer objected to it and he, he couldn't be encouraged to do it for the money that was offered or whatever. And I know some work was done when the bridge went across the river, but I'm wondering, I mean, the lock gates are all well and good, but is the flood alleviation scheme going to be considered? Because that would actually save the centre of chance for flooding, not just us. Absolutely. Is this the Margaretting flood alleviation scheme? Yeah. It's yes, it, by Highlands, yes. That's right. It was mentioned um, and that we would absolutely reference the report on that. I think because I, I hadn't previously seen it being new to council work, but I have a note in my notes from the work, my notebook from the workshop um, that mentions the flood alleviation scheme storage of water and has look at report in capital letters. So that's definitely something for consideration. And it came from officers when they were presenting to us. Yeah, because the water levels around here are extremely fragile in yes. high water, uh, so much so that if we didn't open our gates, it could back up to the Army and Navy. It's oh. that fragile. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. We've lived with that for 20 years. It's just that I think it's all well and good looking at gates and things, but the bigger scheme is are the parks now in Central Chancellor because the houses are so close. Yes. Also, the high-density housing now on the corner at, at, that currently being built as fire. Um, that's so close to the water's edge that Absolutely. it would be quite ridiculous, actually, if, if something went wrong. Yeah. Quite dramatic flooding there and not too distant past. Um, I remember seeing images. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. I thought I'd mention it. Thank you very much. Yes. I will certainly address that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we can move on. That was a quick fast forward. So this is uh, timely because here we have uh, an imagining, a reimagining, if you will, of um, the Bado Meads and the floodplain um, running up to the Army and Navy. Um, the image you see here is from a, a, a study at MSC students, Michael Eek has presented who's uh, studying landscape architecture at Rickle University College. Students were present um, at the workshop on the 14th, um, bringing forward ideas. Um, I hadn't encountered landscape architecture on this, on this scale, a sort of visionary scale before. Um, the idea really is we all know we need to make towns and cities more resilient to the extremes of changing climate. Um, and landscape architecture looks to work with nature, restoring habitats and such as floodplain meadows um, to help slow, store and filter the flow of water, um, replenish drinking water and help to protect vulnerable communities and extend the life of flood defences. Um, indeed, within our local plan, they, um, there's a quite an extensive um, appraisal of landscape and uh, the landscape impact assessment was obviously made ahead. Um, and there's a very um, in-depth study of the Lower Chalma Valley landscape. Um, and it's actually quite a beautiful and poetic <laughs> report. Um, this is what we base um, the, the future local plan on when we draw up the documents. It's one of the first initial stages of drawing up um, the local plan. And then that leads to the master plan for areas like the floodplains um, around the Chalmer. 
and the master plan stage involves lots of local stakeholders and again residents can come forward ask questions and it's um, it's quite a, a fluid process if you'll excuse the expression at the time um, and oh, gradually over time we we formalize uh, planning policy um, in more detail for that area um, I think the sorrow of uh, having sort of had a passion a passion for ecological um, projects and and uh, and the frailty of the habitats over the years um, due really to human behaviour. 97% um, of our grasslands have been lost since the 1930s, um, mostly due to agricultural intensification. And now we, we have only around 1,200 hectares of species rich floodplain meadow like this um, remaining in the whole of the UK. The floodplain here, um, well, it probably it would date back to. Um, Neolithic times um, and we can see settlements, uh, early Neolithic and Bronze Age settlements that run close to the river now. The value of the floodplain meadows was well understood in medieval times too when the Doomsday Book recorded them as 10 times more valuable than arable land. This is because really without them people couldn't keep animals alive through the long hard winters. They're an underrated habitat now providing a wealth of benefits but they're one of our most threatened. The value of floodplain meadows goes way beyond the beauty and, uh, beauty and wildlife benefits. The many benefits we get include storing our flood waters, keeping soil and nutrients out of rivers and helping to protect water quality. Floodplain meadows naturally productive without the use of artificial fertilizers. They recover well after floods and remain productive during droughts. Their varied plants support a wealth of vital pollinators and provide valuable nutrients and minerals for grazing animals. So if we go to the next slide. The continuation of, of Michael Ether's dissertation work really. It shows a band of um, the on the left hand side is the area it's very small but that's um, an area of development um, I think is outlined on the local plan coming forward um, this again is just an, an image it's a it's a, an artistic and technical exercise um, as a landscape architect to come up with something that has a, a natural synergy um, this was particularly eye-catching because of the amphibious walkways and pathways that he's woven through the um, floodplain and you will know it probably from uh, the wild-ish ponies that we see. Um, they do have owners, I believe, but they, they wander the plains and they, um, they graze. And it's just, it's the most beautiful site and obviously highly functional in that it regularly floods. Um, I understand that uh, residents of Barnes Mill is, will find uh, the, this familiar site probably through the winter as well. And it's um, an ever-changing landscape. The idea behind um, the project of in, uh, focusing on Sandford Mill was really to uh, embrace the heritage of the site itself and look to the future. Um, we understand that the function of the museum there, a very important cultural and, and heritage significance of, of the building and its history, both as a mill and a waterworks. And we want to look to in imaginative ways of of really regenerating that area, but in sympathy and in em having empathy with um, the natural habitat, which is, um, as you've mentioned, it's very fragile. So really to honor the character and to ensure that we don't impact negatively on the landscape. If you have any questions about the um, little university studies or if, if you'd like to see more of their work I can be very happy to share details of the people who took part in the workshop and if you have any questions specifically about Sanford Mill I can certainly take them to uh, Marie Goldman who's a deputy leader and is working uh, as part of Connected Chelmsford um, on raising awareness and looking at options for this site and its future.
Hello, can you hear me now? Yes? Hello. Hello, sorry, it's Leonora again. Hello. Um, the um, top end of our property backs onto the area very close to the Fox and Raven and Miller and Carter. Yes. And that area there is an SSI, which yes. you probably know about. So yes. that really can't be changed. And it's become quite marshy. And often people say to us when they're walking along the river, can they get across to the pubs? Because most of the year that is not transversible. You can't walk across there. It's very muddy. And you've got a lot of footpaths coming from the bridge and, and underneath the bridge going across that area. What I would say is that area now is grazed by the horses. They're contained there now. They don't move up close to the river now because they were pushing the banks in and it already needs dredging. So boats were finding it impassable. But the area that you're looking at is natural floodplain and to have a lot of walkways there, if we did have floods, the cost of cleaning it for, for walkways would be phenomenal and yes. sometimes that goes underwater several times a year and the way it is now I'm not saying it's perfect but the way it is now means that it is more natural than if you made it a wildlife park it is already a wildlife area but it is it is untidy I get that but it is naturally marshy and to actually try and restrict water seepage into that area would be a big mistake so close to the town yes thank you I should clarify really that use of the phrase amphibious walkways and that sort of dynamic shape I think was just to bring a sense of movement to the plan um, as a landscape architect would um, it wouldn't necessarily be formalized as pathway um, but I I can certainly uh, put you in touch and and share the, the yeah. presentation with you so you'll see I mean and this is just this is one of I think we had three or four presentations on the day of different approaches to landscape uh, architecture it's not a formal plan it's just uh it is just a, a project based on on research and using okay. the skills of, of the students the fact that the area has been respected for what it is because you'd be amazed how many planning applications there's been for a hotel alongside the fox and raven or absolutely yeah. too close to the floodplain and it's ridiculous we've yes. got we don't want chelmsford to flood no, chelmsford very easily flood i understand is it countryside who are putting in applications um i don't know um they tend to avoid me as much as they can <laughs> okay <laughs> but that, yes um, we, we do know there's been on, development yeah anything on floodplain is ridiculous it's, absolutely it's just not on it floods we have pits you know it floods thank you We can move move on. If there are no more questions on that. So we move to river use and navigation. Um, one of the statements, um, I think, I believe this is from our terms of reference, a uh, reference for the for the um, uh, waterways working group, um, and. You'll see, I, I read it because it's rather, perhaps rather small for you. With varied users and stakeholders, it is important that all views and interests are noted to help make the most of future opportunities while seeking to overcome barriers for expanding and diversifying the benefits of our waterways. There has been a revival um, in cities and around the country um, and an awareness of the value of waterways and canal networks. Um, and I'm sure you're all uh, passionate about this and we need to achieve a balance between um, the overuse um, and footfall, as it were, uh, around those areas, especially where um, the habitats are so delicate and, um, and then engaging lots of different users so that people also benefit from the health and well-being aspects of being close to water and enjoying sports and uh, paddle boarding which is, is seems key to leisure um, and increasingly so if we look at the navigation on the next slide and these are some of the opportunities and um, some of the activities that we already see on our waterways um, leisure cruises moorings and access um, it's important to establish probably some more moorings and access by road down to the riverside um, so that users can can um, 
to make sure that they can service their boats. Muddy Waters was a, a much loved restaurant, I believe, um, and um, Riverside cafes are plenty along the Chalma, um, although they have issues of their own in terms of congestion and um, certainly at the moment uh, parking as the cafes have been shut and we've had an awful overspill onto local roads. Paddle borders we've seen out in abundance on the Chalmer um, increasingly during the lockdown period as the weather grew warmer um, and canoeists certainly having um, making use of the canal and also navigating the locks and the sea cadets who currently are landlocked I believe at Boswell School and we really would like to see them located to somewhere more convenient and practical. And in terms of our tow paths, it's not just about being on the water, but we also have issues to address along the tow paths. Seeing increasing numbers of people again during lockdown as people perhaps discovered for the first time the richness of the local waterways. So ramblers, families, runners, meeting cyclists, dogs, canoeists who have to come out of the water to bypass the locks, paddle boarders who perhaps are new to the to the experience and um, are also uh, perhaps in peril on occasion and we would we would like to see something safe um, and reliable for them um, and perhaps some training uh, in a safe place and horses which were brought up um, by one of our councillors who mentioned the fact in the very name towpath and no equestrian um, elements have been mentioned at all when we're talking about the waterways and how we might be able to incorporate some safe bridal ways um, within the scheme. Another very important and increasingly important element um, is outdoor learning, and that's for all ages. Uh, waterways are not only biodiversity um, havens and, um, and tranquil places, but they're also places that spark imagination and children are just drawn to these habitats and it's vital that we respect them um, and can provide um, some outside of the classroom education um, certainly now um, in the times when uh, just to be inside the school building isn't possible but again we need to tread gently i do think that the younger generation is leading the way really in its understanding of what we're doing to the planet and I would like to think that um, there is a, a very healthy future um, for the way we teach our children and the way that they then um, go on to teach future generations. If anyone has any suggestions, if anyone knows outdoor learning projects perhaps along the, the riverways, um, heritage, um, history that we can engage with and try and um, promote um, as we link up um, the different locks along the navigation and the Whit River Chalmer, please let me know. And if you have any questions about how we perhaps engage or take things forward with the river users that have been mentioned tonight, I'd be very grateful for any comments. Hello. Uh, sorry, William, I don't seem to be able to get the video of myself, but ha have you got me sound wise? That's Roy. Yes, I can. I can see your name, Roy. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I was very pleased to hear you mention the amount of use that we've seen over the recent month or so along the navigation. I mean, it's been quite unprecedented uh, all the way along, e even the locks that have got very limited or no vehicle access. The activity has been, been uh, something we've never seen before. And you mentioned it has caused parking problems. Uh, we've ended up with double yellow lines at Home Mill. Uh, we've got waiting restrictions at Paper Mill. Um, that's not actually solving the problem. It's simply moving the problem. And what we're going to have to do is find ways of accommodating 
the number of visitors that are coming. We don't we see this probably dropping off a bit, but I think now people have found the, the navigation. They are going to keep coming. They are coming to, as you say, to walk, to canoe, paddleboard, uh, experience it. And I think we're going to get a lot more of this in the future. So we do need to work together to find ways of, of resolving that without spoiling the navigation. Um, because we haven't got the land to do it. So it's got to be joint, joint working. And uh, I'm hoping the Waterways Group will be able to do something about that. Sanford Mill, I think, will be a good starter from that point of view. Absolutely. Um, Sanford Mill and the difficulties that we're seeing with congestion both came in today on the email about next week's meeting um, of the group members. So I will certainly be raising it there and follow up with you, Roy. Thank you. It's Deborah. Sorry. Sorry, it's Deborah Wilk speaking. My video is not working either. Hello, Deborah. That's okay. I can see your name very clearly. <laughs> Good. I, I'm secretary of the Canoe Club, and it's just to say that um, we're not even open properly. Well, we're not open because we're a club, and so there will be more canoeists and kayakers out there as well. Yes. But I suspect that at the moment some of them will be parking at some of the places you're saying because they can't use the club. Understood. Thank you. So, there, so there'll be more of us and less of us. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, any further questions on this section before we move on? If, William, if I can come back again. Um, just to say that I've sent a video the other day, it showed somebody walking the towpath, the length of the navigation during the winter, uh, which highlighted the extreme muddy conditions along the towpath. And this is another dilemma we have. We have surfaced some towpaths. Uh, in the winter they are very well used. This again is a question of trying to deal with the footfall along the towpaths without actually urbanising it, without spoiling the character. Uh, and again I think that that is possible but it's something again that I think has got to be dealt with as we find more people actually using the navigation throughout the year. And not, not just boating, these are just people who come to visit uh, you know, for the, the rural experience. Thank you. Hi, um, we're, we're a, a group of, uh, of people that are just up at Springfield, Springfield Basin. And it was just really a question about uh, things like parking and, and access. And that's one of the things that at the end of the, the navigation is a real issue. So I don't know whether you have any, uh, any thoughts on that. In fact, this was raised by Roy when I came to a, a, the open day, I think it was last, gosh, September, or perhaps it was earlier in the summer. And then we had a, a boat trip out, um, uh, a boat full of councillors went down the river and, and we engaged more in discussion about this. Um, yes, it is an issue and um, the land ownership is also an issue as we need obviously access to run through um, and have sufficient slipways. Um, certainly something that we need uh, further conversation with, with Roy and colleagues um, to ensure that there is there's sufficient parking and access without um, overwhelming the, the residents of the basin and the new development. Well, well, frankly, there is absolutely no parking and very little access here. No, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things that we would like to see is some engagement with the council to see how we can create some resident access here. Yeah. And parking. Thank yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, hi, I don't, it's uh, Annie here from Hello, Francheville Paddleboards. Hello, Annie. 
Uh, not a question, just an observation, just to reiterate what Roy has said. Um, we're very active and have hang up and down all the time and have been for many years. And um, we have never seen anything like what we've seen in the past few weeks. And, you know, we've talked to residential managers and people we know and sort of picking up um, anecdotally about some of the issues of the congestion, the parking, the abusive behaviour, the litter the lack of toilet facilities so we've got a bit of a perfect storm of good weather and, and, and people wanting to get to water um uh, but it's there has been a very on the whole as well a very happy atmosphere down there um but the thing that struck me is just how far people have traveled uh because i chat to people as i go about the, the waterway and it's just a point really to say that i have i've been absolutely staggered with just how far people are traveling uh, to use it and I think it just shows that it is a really important asset uh, for, for our for our lives and our, and our county really that, that's just my point. Thank you Annie now that's appreciated thank you and I will make a note of that. Okay shall we move on? Or? Yes I'm happy if everyone's Happy to move on. There's always an opportunity for discussions at the end if anything pops into your minds as I'm talking about the, the next area, which is dear to my heart. And um, we're moving on to river environments and ecology. So it's been mentioned already tonight, but this is such a fragile ecosystem. Um, more generally, um, we know the threats that are faced by wildlife and and the devastation of of our species and the loss of biodiversity in recent years. And we've been aware of this since, well, officially 1988, when climate change was first acknowledged as a, as a threat and seemed to have been banging on a closed door ever since. The UK's wildlife trusts are instrumental in, in lobbying and encouraging change and action by central government. Also for local authorities to take action. We need stronger legislation and we hope for the creation of a nature recovery network um, as set out in the government's 25 year plan for the environment. The nature recovery networks should be underpinned by the new Environment Act make sure they protect, link and create areas of the habitat which help wildlife to safely move and spread out. This benefits a diverse range of species. Everything is interconnected. Additionally, funding needs to be increased to expand our conservation efforts, including for landscape scale restoration schemes. So how can we address this? Locally, landowners can help by managing their riverbank habitat sympathetically. They can provide generous buffer strips for shelter and feeding areas. This also helps to prevent runoff from agricultural chemicals, especially phosphates used in arable farming practices into our waterways. They can also help to create soft edges to our riverbanks for water bowls to create their burrows in and avoid using heavy machinery close to the edge of watercourses. And we can all help by finding out more about opportunities to help survey our river and wetland ecology and volunteering to help manage habitats with Essex Wildlife Trust and other local cons conservation groups. Indeed, the City Council Parks Volunteers Scheme enables residents to work in local wildlife areas as well as in our more formal parks and green spaces. On the east bank of the River Chalmer, we're fortunate to have Little Waltham Meadows it's a beautiful mix of old flood and dry meadows and older car woodland. It's bursting with wildlife. Newland Spring Local Nature Reserve is one of the locations that parks volunteers regularly visit and skills such as coppicing, which is vital to healthy woodland habitat, are taught here. The site was acquired by Essex Wildlife Trust in 1996 and is classified as a local wildlife site. You may have visited already, but it, you can find it at Back Lane, Little Waltham, and I uh, have the OS map reference if you would like it. It's not just landscape architecture that can help shape our environment. If we move to the next slide, I can introduce you to our ecosystem engineers. 
you'll recognise these. It's not a picture that I took locally, but one that the Essex Wildlife Trust website kindly offered. This is the European beaver. It's a keystone species. It has an amazing ability to alter its surroundings. Where it doesn't have access to deep water, it can build dams that can transform the landscape. It fells and coppices riverside trees, especially willow, which we see so often running alongside our river. This is for food and also for building dams and lodges. In late spring and summer, they eat mainly aquatic plants, grasses, ferns and shrubs, but other times woody species form a major part of their diet. They live in family groups with an average of about five individuals comprising adults, kits and yearlings. Females will produce a single litter of one to six kits per year. Beavers are semi-aquatic and mostly active at dawn and dusk and do not hibernate. The European beaver is really the archetypal ecosystem engineer. They make dams so they can move about and feed in safety. They also like the entrance to their burrow to be submerged for protection. So where they don't have deep water, they can create it. The work they do in coppicing and building dams creates wetland habitat that benefits an enormous number of other species, from amphibians, dragonflies, birds, to water voles. Water voles used to be regularly seen and heard along our ditches, streams and rivers right across the UK. It is a creature that burrows into banks and feeds on reeds and grass and was the lead character, Ratty, in Kenneth Graham's children's classic, The Wind in the Willows. There has been a 30% decline in the places where these river mammals once lived across England and Wales during the survey period 2006 to 2015. But the Wildlife Trust are at the forefront of reintroducing them and caring for those wild places that they need to survive with specific projects underway along the Chalmer, close to Sanford Mill. Water voles too are ecosystem engineers. The burrowing and feeding behaviour along the edges of the watercourses creates conditions for other animals and plants to thrive. If we go to the next slide, it's a habitat, it's a beloved uh, and uh, ever decreasing, I'm afraid, in the country. This wet woodland. This was actually taken in Great Baddow just a week or so ago um, and it's an area that you'll see, I think that's probably a shopping trolley that's been dumped, but this is, this is a very traditional wet woodland. You can see in the forefront of the picture there the, the leaves of an oak and what happens over the years is that the oaks will slowly grow as the, the water levels decrease and so over time they are fragile and, and transient and they do disappear and transform into other landscape. They're quite wild and secretive places with cr creepers and tussocky sedge and lush tall herbs around swampy pools and partially submerged willow trunks. They're some of the most natural woodlands. The type of woodland has a long history in our country, having developed where conditions were suitable once glaciers retreated about 12,000 years ago. However, the landscape is inherently dynamic and it's not long lived. Much of the car or um, flooded woodland today is relatively recent in its origin. The developing woodland gradually dries out the soil and the wet nature of the woodland eventually changes as other species such as oak and ash colonise. Floodplain woodlands would once have been dynamic, changing dramatically after big flood events or shifting more gradually as rivers slowly meandered across floodplains. But found on flat, fertile land, floodplain woodlands have been an obvious target for clearance and agricultural intensification, and little of them remains today. Welcome, any questions? I, I'm, yes, it's Neil Frost again from the Chamber Canal Trust. I'm surprised Roy hasn't jumped in when you talked about um, beavers and they, their enjoyment of willows. 
because I rather suspect the cricket bat willows that provide income for Essex Waterways Limited um, might be part of the beaver's diet. <laughs> they are um, cultivated locally, I know. They, um, I, I think the beaver, the nearest beaver population we have is at Spain's Hall, so it's a little distance for them to travel. And I'm not suggesting that we instantly colonise and threaten our cricket bat market, but um, uh, Roy, if you have any comments, I'm not sure if I'd welcome them, but please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, they would be rather contrary to the uh, the, the uh, operation of the Navigation Act in keeping the waterway open for uh, navigation, uh, canoeing, etc. Um, so I, I think. Uh, we would rather concentrate on uh, otters, waterfowl, waterfowl, uh, kingfishers, etc. But we've got a lot of species already and uh, we need to be looking after those, I think. Okay, my only argument is they were here before us and we hunted them to extinction. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And otters, I believe, have made rare appearances on the banks of the Chama, although it's very closely guarded as to where they are. Uh, we, uh, there were otters introduced uh, oh, about five, six, seven years ago now and they absolutely decimated the moorhens, uh, cleared out the fish in the chelma and caused more trouble and then sadly they died out because they didn't have any food. So um, kingfishers, yes, um, and um, I don't know uh, uh, about the beavers but I wouldn't, I don't think it's sustainable to have otters along the chelma. We, ha we haven't seen one here. I mean, we often had them in our garden, which was lovely, um, but we haven't seen one here for about six or seven years now. But they cleared out fish stocks and they haven't yet recovered. And have you seen any mink? Uh, no, again, not recently. They, they were released. Sorry, that's my dog singing. That's all right. Um, they were released, I believe, by people that got them out of um, uh, fur farms. Yes. And again, they would half kill um, uh, more hens and, and ducks, etc., especially at this time of the year. But yeah. we haven't seen any mink here for probably six, seven years. So I don't think there are any mink around. Probably but gone, but yes. Most, the most dangerous ones are the, oh goodness, I've forgotten the name, the little one, the stoats. Um, and, but, you know, we, we have a few water, water bowls here, but um, they keep themselves very much to themselves. I'm not aware of a lot here. I saw one about three weeks ago, actually, washing itself underneath the trees. So they are here and it wasn't a rat. It was definitely a water bowl. But we don't even, we don't even see visible rats here, which is surprising considering the litter left at Barnes Mill sometimes. So, yes. Um, yeah, but anyway, no otters, please. <laughs> Do more harm than good. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. I, I just want to challenge that. There, there are otters around. Uh, they're very valuable. They predate on mink, so they do get rid of mink. Uh, you know, this, this conversation demonstrates the diverse uh, requirements people have with navigation and the fact that uh, at times we're never going to agree on everything. Thank you, Neil. We always enjoy these debates. It's good. <laughs> it's, it's really healthy. Well, we're nearly there. I'll just um, sum up in the last couple of, of slides, just a couple of thoughts. We must tread gently. We need to reduce our consumables, energy and waste, reuse what we can and recycle what we can't. And we really need to rethink how we live. We're just one carbon-based life form. It seems that the younger members of society are really leading the way in their awareness we have a duty of care to each other and to the planet. I have to say that I'm proud to serve as a councillor within part of a leadership team that's committed to making the city and the wider district greener. I really hope that we can continue to lobby government and get the support that we need and for our wildlife conservation organisations. And we have to strike a balance. Times of the essence and making changes now is vital to protect and enhance the environment and our communities, both locally and globally. So finally, 
it is a matter of achieving balance. And I can see that's demonstrated very clearly tonight by your comments, which are most welcome. And it's really been lovely to have the chance to, um, to listen to you and to have the chance to um, bring across our, our thoughts and, and the progress of the working group in the last year. Uh, going forward, we welcome uh, contact if you'd like to email me directly um, or via William, um, I'll uh, pass on my email address um, and please stay in touch. Um, it's wonderful to have your perspective, especially of those of you who use and live close to the water. Um, and yes, it's really been very valuable. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to continue the discussion um, for a few more minutes, if anything springs to mind, please uh, stay where you are and we will continue the discourse. Thank you. Rose, just before we um, continue any discussion or you answer any further questions then, can I on everyone's behalf thank you for, uh, well, for, for me it's been a very stimulating, brilliant, interesting uh, presentation. I think it's lucky we were, I was muted and we were on Zoom rather than we were in an actual meeting because every few seconds when you raised another point that I liked, I'd say yes and uh, we'd probably have interrupted you. So, you know, so much of what you talked about chimes so well with the Channel Canal Trust's aims and objectives. The, the, the positivity of the embracing of the waterway, of its recreational value, of its ecological value, the, the whole tone of things seems over the last couple of years to have, have turned around to, to be wonderfully positive. So, so thank you for your input on behalf of everybody. Uh, uh, we are very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. That's very heartening. And it's never been more important than to work collaboratively. So, um, yeah, I look forward to continuing that discussion with you. Thank you. It's can I, it, oh, oh, sorry, can I also add to that, uh, that uh, at Essex Waterways, we are really pleased in the change of approach uh, with the local authority, with Chelmsford Council over the last two years, and uh, the interest in waterways again, it's an area we've been, I've personally been striving with for what, 20, 25 years, trying to improve the rivers in Chelmsford, trying to get something done at Sanford Mill. And I think now I'm feeling really positive that things are moving forward and there is an appreciation there of, of our natural assets. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. I'd like to ask, is John here? Can you Hello. hear? Yes, I can hear you. Could you say some more about replacement and raising of bridges? Ah, yes. Now that isn't something I um, have a sort of civil engineering appraisal on. Um, we are working um, on one footbridge in the central area. Um, I need to get the details back to you. I'm very sorry. Um, it was mentioned, I know it was mentioned in the preview to this when it was put on your website. And I'm afraid it rather got lost um, amongst the automatic weir um, documentation. So I will come back to you if I may. Perhaps if you'd like to leave your contact details, I can give you some, um, some uh, uh, advice from officers on where we are with that progress. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Can I just uh, also echo the earlier comments that it's so refreshing and nice to have someone in your position who obviously has a genuine interest and passion for the area we live in which we regard as so special. Um, I think I'll just make one final point which is it's a pleasure to see so many more people coming down the towpath. We would love to see more boats of all kinds coming down going through the lock. I think the challenge is that with increased usage comes occasional problems from just a small minority of people, whether it's in the form of rubbish and litter, or, and I think we've talked with Roy about this many times over the years, unfortunately, we always have horrendous trouble at the lock gates um, where you get 15, 20 or more kids. Uh, we all recognize that particularly in a time of lockdown and everything else, you know, when it's a hot day and there's water there, <laughs> you know, yes. to let off steam somewhere but it unfortunately can get terribly out of hand. And we've worked for so long with the waterways authorities, the local police and PS, PCSOs, and we, mm -hmm. we kind of found a way of just about coping with it. But I can promise you that when your vision hopefully starts arriving, 
with increased usage, something has got to be done to find a way of managing that difficult side that will inevitably go hand in hand with it. And I don't mean to end on a doom yeah, I, note, but it's, it's I just... I completely understand it. Yeah, there can't be a sort of sepia-tinted vision that we have of this idyllic river community. I, I understand the problems and having, having lived in Springfield for uh, of over oh, 2006 we moved to the area and um, I, I know the, the challenges of the groups you're talking about so it's finding provision for them and and teaching them how to respect the waterways as well over time um, I hope that there's a change in attitude we're always going to get some drunken and loutish and dangerous behavior um, and I hope very much that the um, PCSOs or whoever you deal with now are able to support you if you experience that sort of harassment or that, that noise well, it's not us as much, it's the other walkers. There's been so many other walkers and families there and yeah. those people are, are very intimidating. They're smoking weed, they're swearing, they call everybody effing paedophiles. And it's just yeah. not nice for those people. Um, you know, fine, we live alongside it, that's our problem. But um, when you see other people and older people, you know, have been flashed and yeah. told to, to get lost, not so nicely, um, when they say, yeah. hey, can you... Okay quiet or stop jumping in the river or you know you're ruining it for everybody else it's very hard it is hard and I've seen there I think I've seen their artwork underneath some of the bridges and yeah, I know the people that, 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 that lovely new bridge is basically being ruined absolutely yeah. so that's another that's a whole other area to Solves address problem and we've had other um toiletry problems around here during lockdown as well because obviously they're there and that's not nice for other people either so absolutely. it's not on really no nope. And um, we'll, uh, we've got uh, community uh, special constables now in Springfield and it's, it's an area that we can raise with them, but they also can take, they, there's more weight now with a community safety team at Chelmsford's okay. police hub. Um, and, they, and, they, and ASB is one of the top priorities for the police crime uh, well, they're always welcome here for a coffee if they want to come in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll pass that on. They'll be there like a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We're very, very tranquil now. Should we, uh, should we reconvene at another date and hopefully we'll have news on progress on all fronts for you. Well, if, if, if um, <clears throat> everyone's uh, finished and got nothing more to say, then I'll, I'd just like to say to um, thanks again, to Rose, for um, giving us a talk and, and thanks to everyone for, for joining the meeting and making it such a vibrant discussion and um, we'll uh, have uh, have details of our, our next offering in, in due course. Um, we didn't have any uh, feedback forms to uh, virtually give out on th this occasion. I, I wasn't able to work out a way of doing it, but if you've got any um, any comments to uh, to make about how, how this this one's went, uh, gone, then um, do feel free to uh, drop me an email, um, William at chelmacanaltrust.co.uk. Um, and also, if you're not currently on our mailing list and you'd like to be notified about future um, uh, events that we organise, then then you can uh, you can write to me on uh, on that. Uh, that email and um, once again thanks for, thanks very much everyone for joining us and just before you go William we uh, we always appreciate your technical expertise and input but it's been especially impressive this evening so uh, thank you very much and I'm not sure what you're showing us now thank you William thanks again everybody thank you thanks Rose yes. bye bye thank, thank you very Bye. much that's great Good night. Uh, quick Bye. question before we go. Thank you. Oh. Bye. Thank you. Hi. Sorry, um, I'm up here with the Screenfield voters. We're on a couple of screens. Um, real quick question. You mentioned uh, the road bridge over when the, where the new cut is going to go in. That's currently a pedestrian bridge. Is the plans to make that into a road bridge? It's, and it's, what's going to happen with the new cut? Um, it's a, going to be a regeneration of the waterside area um, and a road is part of that but it will be elevated so well above the level of the river um, and we've got some documentation 
I think the council have plans now and we've put a bid in and secured funding for that from central government to help alleviate congestion in that part of the city. So I'll share that with you. Yeah, please. That'd be really interesting. So it's Lucy. And if I, I'm going to, I've got scribbles here. I'm going to make a note of everyone who's asked questions tonight and take them back to William. So hopefully we'll all be able to keep in touch. Great. Thank you. You can always find me on the council website. If you go to find a councillor and look for Rose Moore, um, at this very easy email address, it's rose.more at chelmsford.gov.uk. Lovely, thanks. Thank you, Lucy. I think that is it now. Okay. Lovely. Thanks once again, everyone. Thank you. All the best.